when my publisher texted me and said, number two, right behind Michelle Obama, Washington Post bestseller list, all I could think of was number two. What does it take to be number one? Laura Gasner Otting, she delivers in spades. Success, happiness, wonder help. We're gonna go through all the different stages of how success happens and how it happens for you. My favorite Eleanor Roosevelt quote is, we would worry much less about what other people thought about us if we realized how seldomly they did. Let's get into success with Laura Gasner Otting. So Laura, what's your definition then of success? So I get asked this question a lot, as you might imagine, given what I talk about. And for me, I think there are two numbers. There is the need to make number and there is the want to make number. And I think the need to make number is how, how much you know money we need for our mortgage, put our kids in school, food on the table, vacations, et cetera. But the want to make number is like, how fancy are the vacations going to be? How many are you going to take? Are you giving back to your community? How often? So for me, my definition of success is that everything in between the need to make number and the want to make number comes purely out of joy and curiosity and not out of the ego. Dang, how did you get there? Like, I'm sure as a 20 year old girl starting out in the careers and study and everything, how did you get to that definition? Yeah, well, some of it is because I made my way through the F40s, as my grandmother <laughs> used to call them. So I'm 53 now. So I've been around the block a few times. I've raised teenagers who are now in, in you know, in, in, in college. Um, I've raised a husband, right? Like I've, I've, I've sort of been, I've, I've been around. Like I've been married for 26 years. I'm, I, I, I've, I've got a, some, some miles on the wheels. And so I think after a while, you start asking yourself, well, I did all these things, I filled in all the boxes, and the boxes are all full, but I feel empty. Why is that? And so often, it's because we're doing all of this for other people, we're, we're filling out everyone else's check boxes on their definition of success. And after a certain time, you kind of realize, well, I could keep banging my head against that wall over and over and over again, and have the same result, right, the definition of madness, or I could change something. And once you start changing things and surrounding yourself with different people who have different goals, you, you get a bigger and a broader and a vaster perspective. So for me, it just came from starting to do things that actually brought me joy, that made me happy, that were success in my definition and realizing that I actually worked harder for them. I tried more. I went back to the well over and over again because I actually cared about it. And if you can't be insatiably hungry for someone else's goals, well, what can you be insatiably hungry for? And for me, it was all those things that were driven by joy and curiosity. And I started to notice a pattern. So where do you feel like success became your standard? Like, was, did you choose success as a kid? Was there, a, did your family bring up, where did success become your thing? Oh, see, I think everybody gets handed that definition. Like every one of us gets handed a definition, the scorecard of success, and we put it in our back pocket. We don't even know when we get it, right? But like for me, the first like actual conscious memory I have of that definition was my fourth grade teacher telling me that I was super argumentative and that I'd make a good lawyer. And I remember <laughs> yeah, thinking, well, well, well I, mean, the I mean, the first thing I said to her, of course, was, I think you're wrong, because of course I was argumentative, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but after that, you know, I went home that night and like LA Law's on, Ally McBeal, like there are all these, you know, law and order shows that make the law look really sexy and attractive and, and, and exciting. And so I was like, okay, that, like, that was the definition of success. Like they're rich, they make a lot of money, they're, you know, fighting crime, they're doing all kinds of, you know, they're helping everyone. It, it seemed exciting. And then over time, we keep getting handed those definitions. Like you get grades in school. Is it a good grade or a bad grade? If you're dating somebody, do your parents approve of them or do they not, right? Is it a good person for you or a bad person for you? Do you get into a college? Is it a good college, a bad college, right? So at every age and at every stage, we keep getting handed these, you know, the, these report cards, if you will, but literally and, and metaphorically. And, and they seep into our subconscious and we start defining ourselves by everyone else's definition of success, right? Like I dated a nice Jewish boy. Uh, he was a medical student. He came from a good family. My grandmother was thrilled. Like she couldn't wait to tell her Mahjong group about like, oh, you mean my daughter, Laura, the one who married the nice Jewish doctor, right? Like she couldn't wait. And, but the problem was every time I kissed this boy, all I could think of was like milk, butter, cheese, eggs. Like I had no spark with him. And my grandmother would be like, Laura, you just need to concentrate, right? But like, 
So her definition of success would not have worked for me. And at all of us in every part of our lives have these definitions, whether we realize them or not. So what is your formula for success? If you have a formula or what are the things that need to be there for success to happen? Okay. So I think that people should not be pursuing quote unquote success, just success writ large, because we tend to let that be defined by other people. When I spent 20 years in executive search and my job in executive search was to call the most successful people on the planet and recruit them away on behalf of my clients, which sounds like a hard job. I was calling them because they were super successful, but it actually wasn't that hard of a job because despite all this quote unquote success, they weren't very happy. So they all called me back. And what I started to realize is that the people who I couldn't recruit, and there were not that many of them, the people who I could not recruit, they tended to have four specific things. They had calling, uh, connection, contribution, and control. Hang on, say, I, say those four I, for right, me again. Self-help. Calling? Yeah. So calling, connection, contribution, and control. And I'll define each of them. Um, I, I, I call that package consonants. It's alignment, it's flow, it's when what you do matches who you are. So consonance is made up of calling. What is the gravitational force that gets you out of bed in the morning? The leader who you want to serve, the societal ill that you that, that you wanna that you wanna solve, the business that you want to build, the family you want to nurture, right? Like what is the thing that you care about? Number two, connection. What is in your calendar, your email box, your to-do list? And does that stuff get you closer to or farther from your calling? Number three, contribution. Connection's all about the work. Contribution's all about you. So does this work contribute to the kind of life you want to live, the lifestyle you'd like to have, right? In between the want to make and the need to make number. Uh, the way you, you want to show up in the world, how you manifest your values. How does this work contribute to your life? And then control is how much personal agency do you have over how much the work connects to your calling and how much it contributes to your life. So do you have a say in the teams to which you're assigned, the metrics by which you're measured, uh, the, the prospects that you're given, how the hours you work, the air, the environment that you work in. And so all four of these things are necessary components of consonants, which when you have it, then gives you both success and happiness. And the trick is that everybody's definition is different. So your definition of consonants, how much calling, connection, contribution, or control you need will be different than mine. But also your definition today is different than your definition was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years from now. But what happens is when we're 15, 16, 17 years old, somebody says, pick a path, pick a major, pick a career, pick a trade, pick a college. And you go, okay. But what you don't have when you're 15, 16, 17 years old is a frontal lobe, like the actual part of your brain that dictates good, sound, logical decision making. And so we're asked to make these decisions that are going to affect the rest of our lives. And we literally don't have the capacity to make a good one. But nobody ever says, and by the way, you get to evolve and change and redefine what success means to you. Yeah, I know with my kids, I sort of sit there and say, listen, what do you want the first 10 years of your life to look like? Not your whole life. What do you want to do first? And, and it makes it an easier decision for them. What do you want to try, you know, is, is a big question. With success, there's, there's all, people have different opinions around success and failure. What's your theory on the relationship between the two? <laughs> I love that question because we are told, we are taught that failure is finale. It's like, you're going to fail. It's the end of the road. It's going to be embarrassing. Everybody's going to see, and you're going to be the laughing stock. Okay. First of all, my favorite Eleanor Roosevelt quote is, which is like picking a favorite child, right? She's a brilliant woman is we would worry much less about what other people thought about us. If we realized how seldomly they did, like nobody is paying attention. Nobody sees you. That's why we think everyone is an overnight success because we're not paying attention to the weeks and the days and the months and the years that they're doing the work all alone in the dark when nobody can see. So we think everybody is magical and we're completely flawed when in fact other people are just working harder. So number one, nobody's paying attention. Don't worry about it. We're all a bunch of narcissists with the memories of fruit flies. So we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about any of that. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, Everybody says, do what you do, like do what you, what, what, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? That's your passion. And I'm like, no, what would you do if you knew for sure you would fail? And yet you would do it over and over and over until you got it right. 
doesn't it feel much more like success if you worked for something you really cared about and then you finally perfected it than if you just did something easy the first time? I think, I personally think that the journey is really what we need to be focusing on and not not the the, the end point. Because, you know, you get to the end point, like I interviewed a woman who climbed Mount Everest and I was like, oh my God, when you got to the top, did you celebrate? Was it amazing? Do you have a party up there? And she was like, what are you talking about? You literally take out your phone, you take a selfie and then you get the hell out of there because otherwise you're going to lose oxygen and die. So you have to be excited about the process because the end point is just this one little point in time, whereas the process is really what your life's going to be all about. You're on the Big Success Podcast. We're here with Laura, and we're going to get into what makes happiness and success work together, or do they? Business empires are where most people create the vast majority of their initial income and wealth. Through Brad Sugars' Entrepreneurs event, you will learn how to turn your companies into valuable and sellable assets. Visit bradsugars.com to attend this program as a standalone or as part of Brad Sugars' Entrepreneurial University. So, Laura... You achieve something, the Mount Everest thing, all of that, and you coined a wonderful phrase, wonder hell. Explain that relationship for me. Okay, so what I talked about in the first part of the show, Consonants, was really the the anchoring idea of my first book, Limitless. Mm-hmm. How do we create a change in our career, ourselves, our, our, our workplace, in order to have both success and happiness? And here's what happened. That book debuted at number two on the Washington Post bestseller list, which was amazing, except for the fact that I did not expect it whatsoever. I had done all of this work to try to launch the book, having no platform whatsoever. And all of a sudden it debuts at number two. And I was so exhausted by the work that it took to go into this launch of the book that the part of my brain that dictated humility was like nowhere to be found. And when my publisher texted me and said, number two, right behind Michelle Obama, Washington Post bestseller list, all I could think of was number two, what does it take to be number one, <laughs> right? Because, <laughs> because you, I achieved something I never thought I could would achieve. It was amazing. It was magical. It was marvelous. It was wonderful. And also in that moment, I saw a version of myself. Well, if I got to be able to do that, what else can I do that suddenly I couldn't unsee? And I wanted it. I really wanted it. Like, I didn't even know I wanted it. And suddenly I wanted it. And then I was filled with doubt and uncertainty and imposter syndrome. Like, am I allowed to want it? Is it okay to want it? I'm no Michelle Obama. Like, what? Like, who am I? Like, I'm just lucky I got this. But I still couldn't get out of my head. So the burden of my potential sat on my shoulders and was like, okay, Laura, what else you got for me? It was amazing. It was magical. It was marvelous. It was wonderful. But it was also kind of hell. I had to deal with the anxiety and the dread and the fear and the 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 exhaustion, the burnout that comes with now, how do I fill out my own burden of potential? How do I live up to that? It was wonderful and it was hell. It was kind of wonder hell. So I think this is the area where we, we reach this moment of success and suddenly we're like, okay, I've now found my definition. I'm now pursuing my definition why am I still not happy? And it's because we continue to see what else we're made of and we have to make that decision of whether or not we're going to go for it or maybe let it pass us by. You know, I I was chatting with my daughter yesterday about, you know, setting goals and and all of that sort of stuff. And, And she was like, well, dad, I was with the financial planner this morning. I said, what did you learn? And she said, I learned that I don't know very much. And it was like, It's that thing of what is it about us, Laura, that says when we get to like we get to the corner and we see around the corner and now we go, wow, I can also have all of these things that how do we just say this is great? I'm good. Or is that a possibility? Oh, I think it's absolutely a possibility. So the way that wonder help which is the book I wrote then when I found myself in this moment, right? I I interviewed a hundred different glass ceiling shatterers, Olympic medalists, startup unicorns, everyday people like me and you to figure out how do I get out of wonder hell? Like there has to be a way to survive this moment. And what I learned much to my chagrin, but also much to my liberation is that you don't actually get out of wonder hell because every time you accomplish something, you find yourself back in it over and over and over again. So you have to learn not just to survive wonder hell, but to thrive in it. And one of the ways you thrive in it is to say, I'm good right now. So wonder hell is actually designed as an amusement park. <laughs> what I'm 
<laughs> and I'll explain why. When I wrote Limitless, it was like, okay, you've been given someone else's definition of success. You need to find your own. Now that you have your own, how are you going to change yourself, your workplace, your career to get there? It was a very linear path. But with Wonder How, every one of us, no matter where we are on our journey, find ourselves in a different place. Some of us have doubt. Some of us imposter syndrome. Some of us fear. Some of us burnout. Some of us uncertainty. Like every time, every new level brings a new devil. But there was no direct linear path of which devil came first. They're all sort of like chaos monkeys. They just decide to come whenever they want to come, some two and three at a time. So it was sort of like an amusement park where you go in and you can decide to go to whatever town you want to go first and ride on whatever rides you want to go on first. So the book is organized into three sections, Imposter Town, Doubtsville, and Burnout City, each of which has five rides. And each one of those rides emulates an emotion that you're going to feel in it. And the very first ride of Burnout City is the merry-go-round. When you've just decided to like slow it down a little, chill out, like I'm good right now. And I interviewed somebody in that um, in that chapter who said, look, you know, I started my business because I want to have flexibility and freedom. I want to be there for my kids. And every time we achieve something, I had all of the strategists come to me saying like, you got to grow bigger, better, faster, more. And then I would say, okay, what does it look like? And they would say, well, you're going to have to lean in. You're going to have to nose to the grindstone. You're not going to see your family for years, like, but it's going to be great on the other side. And he was like, nah, man, like I'm good. I've got two young kids and kids spell love. T-I-M-E. And I'm just going to hang out where I am right now for a while. And then when the kids are like, dad, you're an old fart. I don't want to hang out with you anymore. Then I'll grow the business. And so we can all make these decisions depending again on what our own definition is at that moment in time in our own personal lives. Success and happiness, relationship. How do you, how do you explain that? So for me, I find myself at my happiest when I feel when I'm I am trying to master something new. Right. Like when I'm when I'm getting Whitney Johnson talks about the uh, the beginner's mindset. It's there's this S curve where where you start in the S and it's flat and it's hard. You don't know what you're doing. You're messing up nonstop and it just doesn't feel very good. And then you kind of get this little like upswing where the S, you know, sort of comes up and and you're figuring it out. And you're like, yeah, I got this. I got this. Like, all right, I'm starting to crush it. Like I figured out what I'm doing. And then you get to the top and it plateaus again and you don't really learn a lot more. You're sort of doing the same thing over and over again. I ran my search firm for 15 years and at the 10 year mark, I was like, all right, I've solved all the possible problems. Like there's not that much new. Every client comes to us and is like, our problem's so unique. And I'm like, it's unique to you but not to me, which like good news for you. I can solve your problem, but also it kind of got a little boring after a while. And I knew that's when I needed to leave. I knew that's when I needed to sell the firm to my team. So for me, when I'm on that sort of upswing and I'm starting to feel success, I haven't figured it out completely, but I'm pretty close to figuring it out and still innovating on the solution. That's where I am at my happiest. Other people might say, I am risk averse. I like to be at the top. I like to know exactly what I'm doing. Some people like to be like, I love a completely blank whiteboard where I have nothing. I don't know what's next. Everybody's definition is going to be different. And I think it's at, at different points in your life. So for me, my kids are in college. I'm an empty nester. I can have more uh, chaos in my work right now because the rest of my life is very quiet. So I really think it's looking at the sort of holistically, like what's happening in your relationships, in your health, in your business, in, in, you know, in the world, so that you're getting what you need from the, the, the work that you're doing to allow the rest of your life to, to flourish. It's not this sort of work-life balance, but really work-life alignment. So how do people answer the debate in their head then of success bringing happiness? I think that we have been told... Honestly, I think we've been lied to, right? Everybody has said, if you're successful, I grew up in the, in the 80s, right? Lifestyles of the rich and famous. If you just earn enough, if you have enough, big enough house, big enough car, small enough clothes, right? All of those things, you will finally be happy. Right house, right spouse, all of that stuff. And, and, and you know, when I was coming up, it, it was sort of like uh, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a teacher, you're an accountant, you're a mechanic, like you are a insert box here, check we can define you. Like podcaster didn't exist, right? So somebody once asked me um, the, the dumbest question ever on a podcast, I think, is uh, what advice would you give your 22-year-old self? And the reason I think that advice is bad is because, it, first of all, my 22-year-old self would not have listened to an old 53-year-old woman at all, right? She'd be making fun of her clothes. But 
what advice would I give my 22 year old self who's listening to a podcast on her iPhone and it was recorded on the internet? Like none of those things existed when I was 22. So even if we know ourselves, which we don't at that point, the world around us changes so much. And so I, I think that the, the people who I see who have both success and happiness do live in this place of consonance where they really understand what like what is the the the, the problem that they want to solve. What are the skills that they have that they can bring to bear to solve that problem? And are they being rewarded in a way that is interesting to them, whether it's financially, emotionally, karmically, whatever, for solving that problem? And the people who are living in that space, that's really where you find people who are feeling successful, feeling fulfilled. And again, whatever way they define it, you know, being successful might be that you're home every night at six o'clock to have dinner with your kids, right? Being successful might be that you never work in the nights or the weekends. Being successful might mean that you're working 80 hours a week and you're buying a Maserati in a beach house. Like being successful might be that all oh, that you're working in a nonprofit to cure cancer or you're making tons of money and donating to cure cancer. It can be anything. And and I think the problem is that we get um, we get a little tied up in purpose shaming. Right. Like. Yeah, you're successful, but like, are you giving back? Or, well, you're giving back, but, you know, are you really making any money? Are you getting yourself out of debt? Like, everyone's got a yeah, but. And I think we got to we gotta get rid of the purpose shaming because we're giving votes to people in our lives who shouldn't even have voices. You're on the Big Success Podcast. We're going to be back with Laura. We're going to dive deeper into one to hell when we come back. Author, catalyst, and executive coach Laura Gasnor Odding inspires people to push past the doubt and indecision that keep great ideas in limbo by helping audiences think bigger and accept greater challenges that reach beyond their current limited scope of belief. To learn more about Laura Gasnor Odding, please visit lauragasnorodding.com. All right, Laura, one to hell. Phenomenally fun book, uh, amusement rides galore. When you found yourself there and you started interviewing everyone around this place, as you call it now, the amusement park that you can you can hang out. At. And by the way, I feel almost like I go back and read Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You Go when I'm in Wonder Hell. It's like it's, it's a similar dang feeling yes. type thing. Yes, yes. What, what, what was it that led you to this theory that maybe it's just somewhere we got to stay and hang out in and learn through or grow through type thing? Yeah, it's, it, actually, it's an interesting story. So uh, Wonder Hell was really born out of my need to find my way out of it. But I didn't even I didn't start with the theory, um, which I know is how, like, you know, most research and science works. You start with the theory, you do some research, you prove the theory or you, or you don't. What happened was the pandemic and I started just going live on social media, on Facebook to my community every day at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And I would just blather on about something that was happening for like 10 or 20 minutes just to like feel community and just sort of be an upstander and just talk about like what everybody's going through. Here's what I'm going through. I see you. I am you. We're all in this together. And then after about, I'd say three weeks of it, I got really sick of my own voice. I was like, <laughs> I am just, just enough of me already. And I thought, okay, I have lots of other friends because of what I do for a living, write books and give keynote speeches. I meet a lot of really interesting people in the green room, people with wildly more interesting stories than mine. And I thought, well, why don't I just talk to them because they're busy trying to create content also. So I could just do us all a favor and just interview them. So I started having conversations with other people and I hate small talk. So I started like a little podcast that I call big talk because I hate small talk. And uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, I just found somebody who was super interesting, first female F-14 fighter pilot or somebody who created, you know, a business to, you know, I don't know, to, to, to manage rental homes, like whatever the thing was that I, that, that I found. And I just started talking to them about their story. Again, I spent 20 years in executive search. So understanding somebody's story, why they do what they do, like, I don't care so much about why somebody wants to increase shareholder value. That's like a two minute conversation, but there's always a parent or a coach or a, or, or a, um, a mentor or a, a disease, a diagnosis, a world event. There's something that puts somebody on a path and to hear that story about who they are and why they are and what they do and what they care deeply about for me is like catnip. Like I was just like, I want to hear these stories. So I started having the conversations and then I started noticing that every single person found themselves in this place, this like 
and everything changed moment. And that everything changed moment was when they found themselves in wonder hell and they had to decide whether they were going to live into this potential that they discovered about themselves or whether they were going to let it go. And obviously the people who I spoke to all had great stories. So they were people who decided to just let's see what happens on the other side of uncertainty and doubt, and fear and imposter syndrome. So it was super fun to do that. And probably I did about 100 of these interviews. It was probably like around interview 62 that I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> This is starting to sound, I'm not that smart. I was like, this is starting to sound familiar. Um, and, and, it only and took for the me next 62 interviews. interviews. <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time. So then for the next 38 interviews, I was like, okay, so I have this theory that there's this moment and I would tell it to people and they'd be like, yes, I was in wonder hell. Um, and so I realized it was a pretty universal thing that people are feeling. And and what what, again, what was much to my chagrin and much to my liberation, what I realized is that all of these emotions, everything, not just the exhaustion and the burnout, but the anxiety and the dread and the imposter syndrome were all universal. Whether it was someone like me who was trying to figure out like, what do I do now? Can I write a second book? Is it okay? Am I allowed to have a big dream? I don't know. To people who were like a woman who was starting her second billion dollar company, a guy who was an Olympic gold medalist with a gold medal in his pocket, literally standing at the top of the ski slope, about to go on the next run, wondering, I wonder if this is the one where everything falls apart and I'm embarrassed and I'm a fraud, right? Every single person at every single step felt all of these emotions. And so I realized that what we had to do was figure out a way not just to survive this, because there's no surviving it. If we're lucky, there's the next one and the next one and the next one, but really to thrive in it instead. Hey, just a quick one. Uh, when I look in the back end of this, something that's quite surprising to me, I noticed that it says that 82% of you who watch the channel regularly haven't hit the subscribe button yet. So one favor, click that button. If you've watched this show before and enjoyed it, just please click that button to subscribe, hit the notifications bell, and make sure you're a part of it. Because as the show gets better, your success gets better. You know, that moment when you, and you use the words about when you see your capabilities, when you see that, what do you think is the difference between someone that does when they see, holy heck, I can achieve this, it's possible for me. What's the difference between someone who does push in and someone who just goes, you know what? Nope. Staying right here. Oh, hunger, curiosity. And I think also just potential. You don't feel the burden of your potential if you don't have any potential, right? So the good news about Wonder Hell is that it only presents itself to people who are worthy of it. Like if you don't have, if you, if you are just, if you, if you have reached the end of your abilities, you're not going to be like, oh, what's next? Because you just don't see that version of yourself. It's like, in, it's like internal candidates, people who are working a company and they apply for the next bigger job, but they don't get the job, always end up leaving. Obviously, if they're treated poorly, if they're taken advantage of, that's why they leave. But I'm talking about places where they're treated really well, they get their day in court, they have a great interview process, and for whatever reason, they're just not the right fit for that position. They always end up leaving within six months to a year. And the reason is, is because the wearing of the clothes of that role, the speaking and the voice of that role, the thinking and the mindset of that role, they see themselves in that new bigger role and they can't unsee themselves in this way. So somebody who doesn't think about themselves as having more potential would never have applied for that bigger job in the first place. So, you know. Like, it's like if you're, if you're hiking, you, you, you're halfway up the mountain, like you're bottom of the mountain and you look up and you're like, I want to go there. And then you get halfway up and there's this sort of scenic overlook. So you go and you look out at the, at the ridge and what do you see? You see the top of your mountain, but what else do you see? You see the rest of the mountain range, right? And you're like, oh, I actually want to go there. People who don't have hunger and curiosity will look at the rest of the mountains and go, oh, that's pretty. Let me take a picture. People who are hungry and have curiosity will say, how much fuel do I have left? How much water do I have left? How much daylight do I have left? What else can we do? And they're just different people. And it's not to say that one is good and one is bad. They're just different. So if you're listening to this and you're like, yes, that's me. Like I'd say, congratulations. You're already halfway there because we have this, you know, this, this idea that if you can dream it, you can do it. But really what's happening is if you're, you're doing it so you can dream it, you're halfway up the mountain, which gives you the confidence to keep going even further, right? That if you do it, you can dream it. And if you're feeling wonder health, cause you're already doing it. Yeah. And if 
you're probably not listening to this podcast if you don't have that hunger and, and drive exactly. too. That's the thing. Exactly. So it, it does become a little bit of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It becomes like like it's it's a self-selected group of people. You you choose to hang around with people who are hungrier, who, you know, you finish a 5K. You're I ran the first mile of my life right before I turned 40. And it took me six weeks to finish that, to, to run that mile without literally hurling. And at the end of it, I was all hopped up on dopamine and serotonin. And I was like, oh, cool. If I string three of those together, maybe I could do a 5K. And six weeks later, I did a 5K. When I say did not ran, because there was a lot of doing and not a lot of running. <laughs> <laughs> but I did finish it. And at the end of that, again, dopamine and serotonin, I was like, oh, if I string two of those together, I can do a 10K. And now I'm, I'm training for my seventh marathon in, in, in three weeks. So it's not like I woke up one day and I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to run a marathon. But I was like, I'm going to start moving my body. I'm going to go to a boot camp. I'm going to surround myself with other people who are moving their bodies and getting up at five in the morning to go to boot camp. And that momentum, like we surround ourselves with people who listen to this podcast, who dream of more, who feel their own potential, who see your potential. And then we can borrow their confidence until we have our own. You know, it's hard to see what's around the corner until you get to the corner. And it's hard to set that goal of the next thing until you get to the thing. It's like climbing a ladder. You got to get up one rung before you can get to the next one. Laura, I want to ask. It's so true. Yeah. I want to ask you one final question. Best advice you ever got or best quote you ever heard on the subject of success? <laughs> uh, I'll give you a quote. My best advice I ever got when I was feeling successful and didn't feel successful. Um, I was complaining to a mentor of mine. It was this old seven-year-old woman. And I was telling her how, you know, unhappy I was. She's like, what's the problem? I don't understand. Right. It's like, you got a happy kid. You got happy kids, happy marriage, happy business. Like everything's, what's your problem? Like, I don't know. I yell at my kids too much. And I was telling her the story about how uh, I, I pick up my kids from school and, but, you know, cause I want to be a present parent, but I take them to the park, but I've got my phone. So I'm always with my clients. And she was like, what are you talking about? And she said, you're just not that important. Oh. And at the time, I felt like, well, I was pretty insulted. I'm like, I'm super important to my family, my friends, my community. She's like, you're not. She's like, you're trying to micromanage every single thing in your life. And that's not going to work because you're not raising independent thinking children. And you're certainly not raising independent thinking staff members. So you got to figure this out. And what she was trying to tell me is this. You're just not that important except where you are. So figure out what only you can do like the highest and best purpose of your time is what only you can do everything else has to be delegated because you're just not that important except where you are and if you want to be successful and happy you've got to figure out with absolute like just brutality where are those places where the except where you are fits laura gasner arting thank you big success podcast we'll be back next week with more of your success You've been listening to the Big Success Podcast with the number one business coach in the world, Brad Sugars. To learn more about how to achieve business and personal success, as well as how to level up or listen to past episodes, visit www.bradsugars.com.